as a lot of the technologists have done? Or how, does, how do my values and my um, moral morality influence the way technology is actually experienced by my user? And what is my role? And of course, with the recent scandals, with everything with uh, the Daily Stormer being shut down, I think it raised a lot of questions. So I guess my question for you, Scott, is, you know, what do you think the role of the technologist should be in this question, and is tech really neutral? It's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, as we've seen, like, the crisis of culture at Uber and, uh, you know, sort of the, the bigger questions around, uh, is, do Twitter, do Facebook, do these companies have sort of an obligation to, to, to manage traffic, to think about how it's being used? Uh, I think technology in many ways, uh, as it's released, is agnostic. It's sort of without, uh, you know, it, it can be used for good, it can be used for bad, but it's up to kind of uh, the way we structure uh, who we hire, the way we structure sort of how we infuse it with values. Um, I think an interesting example of this, uh, I had a recent conversation with uh, a young woman named Tracy Chow, and she was recently on the cover of uh, MIT uh, Tech Review. And Tracy was an early software engineer at uh, Pinterest and also at Quora. And she made this really interesting statement to me where she said, you know, I studied computer science and electrical engineering my whole life, and I thought that's what I needed to be a good product manager. And she got to Quora and she realized that some of the earliest conversations they were having at Quora, which is a question and answer site, were eff effectively philosophical in nature. So they were questions of, are users inherently good or bad? Are they going to abuse the platform? Or are they going to abide by the rules? If they're good, we don't have to set up moderation queues. We don't have to have certain aspects of, uh, of, of product built. Uh, versus if they abuse the system, then we have to build all these contingency plans. And so she realized that in this process of uh, running a product team at Quora, um, that she really lacked some of the skills that she wished she had studied before. And so I, th I think that going back to Tristan's point about blending uh, philosophers and engineers, um, not necessarily in two different people, but how can we sort of, even within our own education, um, as we remain sort of works in progress, you know, if, if I err more on the fuzzy side, how can I sort of upskill in data literacy? How can I upskill in uh, being more technical? And on the flip side, you know, if you're a deep technologist, how can you upskill on some of these softer skills? You know, can you take uh, a class in improv comedy to sort of get on your feet more, uh, to sort of not be afraid of public speaking? Or can you read more literature, join a book? And the technical competencies. But I think, you know, if you go a little bit deeper into kind of what would that translate? So I, I love the idea of, you know, who do you hire? Right, in terms of character, in terms of moral obligation, and how people think about things, because we all kind of have different values, right? Mm -hmm. So then, um, I think one of the big questions then is, who is right? And who controls what the users can see on the platform or not? And so, you know, because we're a content platform, it's been a big question that we've been debating since day one. What kind of content? And, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about our vision and our values before we had any code written. You know, and our vision is to humanize the world, right? We're a tech platform who wants to humanize the world. Go we'll figure, right? And so I think the whole idea of how does that translate into the day-to-day -day operations of a tech company? What are your perspectives around this whole hot idea? Yeah, I think it goes back to uh, the story I was telling you about the attention economy and uh, Tristan Harris's kind of perspective on, on that as well. And I think that, you know, one of the things that um, we, we can expect, you know, I think we need to put more pressure on technology companies to sort of push the envelope on acting in a, in a decent way because as you do touch billions of users uh, over and over and over, um, you, the impact of that at, at scale is massive. And I think there is a moral obligation for tech companies to be cognizant of the impact that they're having. But on the flip side, uh, I think one of the points that Tristan makes is as consumers, we also wield a lot of uh, influence. And so if we demand that our time be uh, better spent, that we sort of don't just have this lean back approach to technology, but we actually say, wait a minute, you know, I'm going to set limits or I'm, I'm going to sort of push back on things that um, are not optimizing my life for the ways that I want to live, not just, you know, that the scroll infinitely will auto load and, uh, you know, Reed Hastings at Netflix says his only competition is human sleep. You know, uh, we can kind of laugh at that, but in, on some level, uh, that's kind of a disturbing thought. And uh, so I think, I think those are all things that we should be considering as consumers as well. Yeah, 
I think it's funny because you know um, one of the things I think about in terms of you know uh, what uh, what we can do to influence, right? I think about kind of any product. Take like a gun. You know, when uh, there's a gun that's created, there's a there's a, you know a handbook. There's a guide, right? Should there what kind of handbook or guide should there be for people? Like I created a product. This is a platform. This is how it's intended to be used, right? And yeah. so uh, it's it's a question that we've been debating with around what is the manual? Is there a guide? You know, for the user, so that hey, don't get hurt. You can get hurt, and you know, we know that suicide rates actually have increased because of social media. We understand that depression is going up. So, what is that user guide or manual for technology? You know, what's interesting is uh, how product innovation sort of moves through systems. And in the process of interviewing uh, many different people for, for the book, um, one of the interesting uh, comments that somebody made was that the scroll. Of, of Facebook and of newsfeed in general um, actually comes from an innovation from a hardware design in many ways. And so if you think back to the original iPod, the iPod was beautiful in the sense that it created an infinite ability to scroll through thousands and thousands of songs, not you know by having a list that was really long, but by having uh, a physical circle that you could kind of circle your, uh, your finger and you could infinitely scroll. And that was a hardware product innovation that sort of translated over to the software world. And I think you know that uh, you know as we trace some of these uh, things things through, um, you know basically we we as consumers uh, are kind of being pushed technology. But I think in, in many ways we can kind of push back on what we choose to use, how we choose to engage, um, you know, through through movements like time well spent. No, I, I, yeah, so I think what you're talking about is kind of the joint responsibility, right? I think so. Of, like, of the entire ecosystem of users, the, the technologists, and maybe the whole ecosystem, right? And so maybe you're shifting gears too, because I, you know, you talked a lot about this idea of being human, mm -hmm. you know, and so what does it mean to be human? I think, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to sort of the, the, the final points around, um, I think what's, what's not human are many of the things that we're concerned about losing. Uh, we're so concerned about you know, losing certain tasks within jobs, and in many ways, um, you know, if, if we can better optimize a process that's uh, a highly repetitive rote process that I don't do very well, and I, and I, would, you know, I poorly manage myself, but technology can help me um, through sort of intelligence augmentation rather than just taking over entirely, but supplement what I'm able to do. Uh, I think that enables me to be more human. It enables me to focus more on on engaging with other people, on uh, dealing with sort of complex problems that haven't been seen before, uh, dealing with collaboration. Um, so there's really interesting research by a guy at Harvard uh, at the education school named David Deming, and he talks about the importance of soft skills. And uh, the reason he said soft skills are important are because when we have this world where machines take away more of the rote, scripted tasks, more of the simple and complicated tasks. Um, what's left over are these things that require, uh, they're, they're more complex, they require more specialization, where you're really good at one thing and I'm good at something else. And in that environment, we trade tasks more frequently. And actually, the way that we reduce friction in task trading is, is through soft skills. It's through the ability to communicate, the ability to collaborate. And I think that, you know, ultimately, enables us to be more human. No, I totally agree and I'm, I'm laughing because you know if you think about education system and the reason why we have the modern education system it actually came from the Industrial Revolution where um, we basically we were trying to teach people how to be machines mm -hmm. because you needed to create the same black Ford car the same in the same exact way so you needed to automate that process and machinery and you know we didn't have robotics you know an AI back then so you had to train a bunch of people to actually be like machines and to, to actually perform these tasks. So in some ways, our modern education system has been designed to actually dehumanize and to make us behave like robots. So you have the rote memorization, you have tasks, you, you, you get us to memorize things and do the same thing over and over again, yep. right? And so you know, one of the things I'm obviously very passionate about is how do we actually disrupt the way that we actually learn? And how do we start to redefine what education really is, right? So these are big questions for 15 minutes, but I think... Uh, of course, in, in the next two minutes, right? <laughs>
In general, um, I think by mixing up uh, curriculum and, and not sort of thinking about it in this sort of humanities and sciences and thinking about it in STEM and liberal arts, it's actually, uh, can we integrate the two? You know, in many ways, um, I, ha I had a conversation with the university in Indonesia recently where um, they're trying to redesign the curriculum around computer science. And uh, we had this really interesting conversation about computer science as a foreign language, about sort of looking at it from 60,000 feet and understanding sort of the core mechanics that go down to electrical engineering and binary, um, all the way up to the sort of most recent languages that, that we might learn. And can we think about that almost as an ecosystem? Can we think about that from a completely different vector? Um, and I think uh, the same way that we study philosophy, you know, we can read Mill and Kant and, and all these you know, old philosophers and, you know, sort of dusty books, but we can also think about the principles in really modern ways. You know, we can think about utilitarianism and uh, other types of, of, you know, consequentialist ethics and, and, and think about them in terms of self-driving cars, think about them in terms of artificial intelligence, but I think that, um, relying on a pure philosophy teacher to sort of expect them to learn and master the new technologies and expect a technologist to necessarily master all the old uh, philosophers is a tough sell. So I think in many ways we've got to mix up the curriculum and sort of get people that are good at different things to kind of work together on these. I think I totally agree. So I think there's one element which again is was about kind of the topics and things that you're learning. But I think, you know, there's also a need to disrupt the way that people are learning. Yeah to teach people in a way that is more human, that actually fosters, like you said, the creativity, yeah. the critical thinking, getting them to make better decisions. And so I, there's, I think, almost a, kind of we need a renaissance, yeah. a redefinition um, re of how people are learning so that it's actually whether, you, even I believe you should learn STEM in a human way. So one of the examples uh, in the book and, and a personal friend of mine is this guy, Matthew Breimer, who founded General Assembly. And uh, Matt actually is a sociologist, uh, and he talks about all of his tech companies. He's got multiple technology companies now. Um, he says that they have effectively all been sociology experiments for him, where he said, I'm going to test out this thing and, and, and see if it works. And uh, it's probably a good entrepreneurial characteristic. But back in 2011, 2012, uh, the venture firm that I was with, we passed repeatedly on General Assembly. It's part of our anti-portfolio, like the companies that got away, the ones that we wished you know, we had invested in. And the reason uh, we passed on the deal so many times was because the whole world was moving online. Education was all going online. We thought if we could put a video lecture uh, on Khan Academy, why would we ever do anything offline in a physical space that costs money to rent? And uh, General Assembly had this whole premise of building community in physical spaces. And it was exactly that. It was uh, an urban community college for tech literacy in a really human way, in a, a place with you know uh, big windows and uh, you know after hours beers and it, it was a, a very kind of collaborative space that allowed people to be human and I think that sort of blending is why they've, they've been successful. No, and I I love the idea and one of the things I, I I also agree is that tech should never replace humanity and never can for some of the reasons that you stated and I think technology is powerful to enhance the human experience you know which is I know what you know we're both passionate about and so as we wrap up you know this conversation you know um, I think I'd love to actually have you join and actually all of us you know really join this idea of starting a tech renaissance which is where is where the fuzzies and techies come together where it's about redefining and exploring the role of morality and ethics in the technologies and the platforms that we create. So um, as we wrap up this conversation, I know you're gonna enjoy the rest of the day with lots of different speakers, but I'd love to actually um, invite both the users and the creators of this ecosystem to join us on this tech renaissance because I think it's the most important question that we're gonna be facing in this generation. So thank you so much, Scott. Thank it's you. great to chat with you. All right. Thank you, Scott, and so young for your dialogue. That was really enlightening. Actually, when, when the more they talked, the more I felt like...